we want to begin the semester by looking at the meaning and purpose, the aims of theological studies. So for the first part, we will look at, well, what is theology? Why do we study theology? And how do we go about the study? The second part will focus on an exemplary model of doing theology, and that's St. Thomas Aquinas. There we will look at, well, who is St. Thomas? And what has he written in theology? We'll actually read directly from one of his writings. That's your required reading for today. So let's get started. We'll start first with a very foundational question. Well, why are you here anyways? Why are you here in this uh, recorded lecture doing theology? Well, you might say, well, it's required. It's the second core theology requirement at UST. I want a degree in XYZ and I have to take this. Well, that's fine. And you're here, that's what matters. And you're here because of your education. And so we want to locate the work of theology within the broader plans of your educational endeavors. So first, uh, let's get to the nature of education. You can understand what education is, or at least one view of education, by looking at the word itself. Education comes from Latin roots, and the word in Latin is educare. So we have here a, or the e, which serves the same function as the prefix of exit, e as in out of, or to emit, to exude, the e. So it is out of, and then we have ducare, which is the verb to lead. So the idea of education is that there is something dynamic happening here. There is a leading. That means someone is leading. And this is why you didn't simply pick up a, a, a book on theology and read on your own, but rather you've enrolled at university where you will uh, engage with uh, professors, men and women who have studied topics ahead of you and they can lead you in this pursuit of knowledge and understanding. So this being led, it's dynamic, there is someone leading, and it's leading somewhere. The E expresses that we are being led out of something. The idea of education is that we are being led out of the darkness of our not knowing into the light of understanding. Well, here at the University of St. Thomas, we promise to give you a liberal arts education. Well, in what sense is education liberal? What does it mean for education to be liberal? Well, you have the cognate of the word liberal, and you see liberate to free. This knowledge is knowledge that frees you. In the classical sense, liberal education was the kind of education that was given to the men who were free, who were not tied down to the menial labors that were necessary to put food on the table, but rather they were free to study the disciplines of their own interests. And ultimately, liberal can mean generous. So if you're a liberal giver, you're a generous giver. And what we're looking at here in education is that a liberal arts education seeks to give you a well-rounded perspective of all the disciplines. This is why there is a core requirement in which you study topics beyond your major. So you are not only seeking to gain the technical skills or the knowledge that you need to be a good doctor or dentist or scientist, but rather liberal arts and Catholic liberal arts wants to make you a well-rounded human being not only with the technical skills and, and knowledge, but also with an understanding of the human spirit, with an understanding of human culture and history and language and philosophy and theology. So theology has a special place in the construct of education. So the value of a liberal arts, giving you the skills to think from different perspectives and to gain knowledge that is unified um, so our knowledge is not to be uh, disparate parts, like piecemeal, um, here and there, and know a little bit of this and that, but rather at the university, universitas, things come together. Knowledge as a whole is universal. Still, we probe the question further. What does theology have to do with this liberal arts education? Here we turn then to our first question of what is theology? And again, we can parse the word, theo and logos. Now, these are Greek roots. Theo is the word for God. For example, if you think of a monotheistic religion, 
Mono is one, theistic, referring to one God. Uh, a religion that believes in only one God is called monotheistic. And then we have the root logos, which is the Greek word for word. And words are not simply uh, noises that we make, but rather words are the ways that we communicate, meaning words should be intelligible. They have meaning and purpose. So logos is the word for word, but it is a word of reason. And this is why logos or logi at the end of a word refers to the study of. If you do psychology, you are uh, entering into the study of the human psyche or sociology, the study of human society, or biology, the study of the bios, or of life. Well, similarly, in theology, we have the study of the theos. We are studying God in all things related to God. Now, this is going to be very important in um, integrating all of the disciplines of knowledge. A classical definition of theology, which I would like for you to know, and so you can expect to see this, um, on an assessment later, uh, is the definition that St. Anselm of Canterbury gives us in the early 12th century. Anselm, the father of scholastic theology, defines theology as fides quorens intellectum. What do we mean by this? These are Latin words. Fides is faith. Intellectum is what it looks like, intellect or understanding. What is quorum? So what is the relationship of faith and understanding? Does faith negate understanding? Does faith oppose understanding? Does faith reject understanding? And is that then the definition of theology? No, none of those are, are the proper definitions of theology, nor do they describe theology in any accurate way. Because theology, for Anselm, is fetus corns intellectum, corns being seeking. We have a very positive, active word here, the verb for seeking, corins. In theology, what is happening is that our faith is not just a blind faith that believes because I'm told to believe, but rather it is a faith that is groping and grasping in order to understand. It wants the light of reason. In theology, we have the engagement of faith and reason. You are not to bracket your reason or leave it outside of the classroom door or the uh, online modules when you do theology. Rather, this is a uh, university and an academic course. We are going to engage reason rigorously, but in theology, we engage it with faith. Faith and reason do not oppose or reject each other, but rather they intersect in the Catholic view of theology. Now back to our first point here, parsing the words, and we have the root logos. This is significant because where in scripture do we find the logos? Can anyone recall from intro to scripture? Indeed, it is in the prologue of John's gospel. In the very first line, we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the logos, in the beginning, the logos was there. And this logos, if we keep reading in verse 14, this Logos becomes flesh. This Logos, who is God's word, God's reason, God's logic, becomes enfleshed in our world. And this is important because it is with the word, it's in and through the word that the world was created. And this is why there is intrinsic intelligibility in, in creation. And this is what the sciences study. When it looks at creation, it can map out patterns of laws of physics or biology. Why is that so? Why is it that um, nature is intelligible and it's not haphazard? It doesn't just come and go, uh, uh, not obliged to any kind of rule of nature. But rather, it, it does have reason. There are rules of laws of physics because everything was created in the word, in the reason, in the logic of God. And in the person of Jesus Christ, that word is made flesh. And this is why we study theology. Theology is focused on the word made flesh. In this word, Jesus Christ says in John's gospel, I am the light of the world. 
this is a, an important description, self-description by Jesus. Because what does it mean to be light? What are the qualities of light? Light illumines. And this is also synonymous to what education aims to do. It aims to bring us out of the darkness of non-understanding into the light of understanding. Who is the light? It's Jesus Christ. This is why all of the disciplines are intelligible, because the world was created in the Word. And not only that, light has many qualities. Not only does it illumine, but light also emits warmth. So imagine being in front of a fireplace or a campfire on a cold day, and the, that fire, that light, warms you. It emits heat. In the same way, our education, the degree that you aim to possess, the knowledge that you gain at this university, not only illumines your mind, and knowledge is power, right? So it's illuminating, it's powerful, but this power is to be warm. It's supposed to warm your heart and make you more human. Your knowledge and your understanding should not make you more pompous, but rather it should make you, uh, it should empower you to be able to serve and to serve well, to build up human civilization. That's the aim of education from a Catholic intellectual um, perspective. And then lastly, why or how do we study theology? So the question of how is a legitimate question because if we're looking at God, how do we probe the being and essence of God. It's like looking at uh, looking up into the sun and you could easily hurt your eyes, right? Because the reality of the sun is much greater than our eyes can take. And the reality of God is much greater than our minds can encompass. But we approach the study of, of theology in a very particular way. And it is because God has first chosen to reveal himself to us. So revelation is going to be at the heart of the study of theology. We have to acknowledge that God does take the first step to reveal himself in the person of Jesus, whom we will gaze upon in our Christian uh, belief and in our study of Christian Catholic theology. But also, um, this revelation means that we enter into the study not only in an academic way, but in a, with a particular approach. So what I have on the screen here is the great church of Saint-Chapelle in France. And it's a beautiful edifice. It's magnificent. So we can survey it from the outside and analyze its architectural design, look at the rose windows and the great fortresses which hold up the, the stained glasses. Okay, it's magnificent. But that's studying it from the outside. What I'm proposing that we will do in this theology course is to take the perspective not simply from the outside, with reason alone, but to enter into theology, or here enter into the Church of Saint Chapelle and admire its grandeur from within. And what do you see if you go inside Saint Chapelle? It's magnificent. The walls are almost all stained glass. And if you're there on a beautiful sunny day, the light filters through the colored stained glasses. The colors reflect and dance um, on the walls, and it's absolutely beautiful. The analogy here is to say that when you enter into the discipline itself, when you enter into the revelation of God, we have a richer perspective than simply standing as a cold, um, distant bystander making observations from outside. Okay, we can indeed do that, but we want to enrich our view by entering inside. And to do this, this is why we begin each class praying to the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God who illumines and enkindles the fires of our hearts and our faith. So I, I invite you to embark with me on the study of theology this semester. And I, I hope you will, will enter with the same disposition that I'm inviting you to. And um, it will be an adventure ahead of us.